this is the second lecture in this lecture series that the Henry Center is organizing for this year. The first one was by Chris and he uh, started us off by talking about the goodness of creation and the natural world. And so it makes a lot of sense, I think, for me to follow next by talking about the goodness of human beings. So focusing on our character and how good or bad we tend to be. So I'm going to uh, give you a little preview of what's to come. Um, if I can make this work, yes, very good. So here's the plan for today. I'm gonna to start by talking about what is good character. So I'm a philosopher by training, I should say that as well. I'm not a theologian. Uh, if you ask me tough questions about theology, I'm probably going to tell you to send those questions over to Oliver or Max or someone else on the panel and, uh, and deflect them that way. But I'm a, I'm a philosopher who also likes to engage in empirical science and theology as well. So as a philosopher, I wanna start by defining my terms, what is good character, then go into a more empirical discussion, drawing on psychology for the question, how good is our character? And then end by talking about how to improve, cultivating good character in ourselves and others using both secular and Christian strategies. So it's an ambitious plan. I don't know if we'll get to all of it. If I need to, I'll cut it short a little bit to make sure we have plenty of time for question and answer. I'd love to hear your feedback and what you have to say about these ideas. So first of all, what is good character? I'm gonna assume that when we talk about good moral character, we're talking about the moral virtues. Uh, I don't think it's a pretty safe assumption in philosophy. Uh, most people would grant me that. Examples of moral virtues include things like honesty, compassion, courage, temperance, fortitude, graciousness, and the like. Same thing with bad moral character. We're gonna flip that around and talk about moral vices. So for every virtue, there's gonna be a corresponding vice. So honesty, dishonesty, compassion, callousness, temperance, intemperance. Ca uh, courage, cowardice. So that's where I'm gonna be starting from. Of course, that doesn't get us very far because you might then ask the question, well, what's a moral virtue? I mean, you told me that good character is a matter of moral virtue. What's a moral virtue? I could bring out a philosophical de definition at this point and make it very abstract and technical um, and I bore you to death and uh, so I'll spare you that. I'll get into it in a different way. I'll give you an example, uh, the example of compassion. Let's build up to a characterization of a moral virtue. So if someone picks up some drop papers only once, is that sufficient for being a compassionate person? And if this was in person and live, I would have the audience there and I would ask you and you know, ask you to raise your hand and so forth. I can't really quite do that. Um, so I'm guessing what you're gonna say is no. Hopefully you'll say no, you better say no. Uh, we're not gonna get very far today. Um, so is that sufficient for being a compassionate person? No, why not? Well, only once, I mean, you gotta do it more than once. I mean, there's not enough frequency. It looks like there needs to be some frequency to our helping in order to be a compassionate person. So let's add that. If someone frequently helps, but only when it comes to picking up drop papers, is that sufficient for being a compassionate person? And it looks like, no, of course not. You know, I ask you again, you know, what do you, how do you react to that case? And you say, of course not. There needs to be some diversity some cross-situational consistency to one's helping. It can't just be limited to picking up dry papers. That would, in fact, be a really weird person who just did that. So let's add that too. Um, if someone is being reliably helpful in various situations, so reliably more than once over time, and in a variety of different situations, not just one situation when it comes to picking up dry papers, but only for purely self-serving reasons, like making a good impression on your significant other, or putting yourself in a good mood, or getting rewards in the afterlife? Is that sufficient for being a compassionate person? And here again, I would ask you to raise your hand or not and tell me what, what you think and uh, to take a quick poll of the audience, but I'm guessing, I'm at least I'm hoping that you're gonna say no, because that's my view. Because in this case, the behavior is great, but the motivation's not so great. Looks like there needs to be some good motivation or virtuous reasons behind one's helping. This is a very common view going back to Aristotle in particular, and lots of people who work on character, I think would accept this. So to summarize the first part, my kind of framework and my, my background, uh, a conception of good character and moral virtue, abstracting away from compassion, that was our, our example to get us into it, Building on that, building on what we said, I'm gonna say that any moral virtue, including compassion, looks like it leads to behavior that is morally admirable, 
Uh, I mean, it better be morally admirable. That'd be, again, that'd be strange if it wasn't. In diverse range of situations relevant to the virtue, not just in the picking up the papers situation, stably over time, so not just once, but you have a stable pattern of that behavior over time. And finally, primarily for good and admirable reasons and motives. Now there's likely more to a virtue than that. I'm not saying this is exhaustive. I'm just saying these are necessary conditions or necessary features, but I think this is gonna be good enough for today's um, projects and what I wanna to do to accomplish today. So I'm gonna end there in terms of characterizing good character as from a philosophical perspective. And I think also I would say a, a Christian perspective too, and move on to part two. So here we have a different question. How good is our character? Using the terms we've already introduced, how virtuous is our character? I do we tend to have the virtues? I'm gonna take those questions to be synonymous with each other. And so you can pause for a moment and ask yourself, well, what do you think? How good is your own character? How good is the character of your friends and family? How good is the character of people in general? Form formulate your own answer. And I'll tell you my answer. And I'm gonna uh, give you a little warning. It's gonna be depressing. Um, so to, to, this, is, this is what's to come. Um, it's not gonna be a rosy picture. In fact, I say for most of us today, our character is not virtuous at all. Most of us today do not have any of the moral virtues. Hey, I warned you, I didn't give you much warning. I have to, that was a little unfair. I should have given you more warning, but yeah, it's not a very rosy picture. And so how did I come to that conclusion? Well, I could have come to it in a variety of ways. I think it actually multiple sources of data converge on this conclusion. One is I could have come from it, uh, to it from a Christian perspective. So if you make a, an empirical prediction based upon the New Testament, I think it would be something like this. Um, most of us do not have any of the moral virtues. That's what I think Christianity would lead us to expect. I could have come to it through a historical study looking at uh, various uh, case studies throughout history. You could look at, at it, approach it from contemporary current events, political politics and the like, but I don't wanna get into any of that. So what I, in fact was my basis or my source of evidence was psychological research. So I looked at in my own work over the last 10 years, I've been looking at hundreds and hundreds of studies which put people into different situations and probe their character. Situations where there's an opportunity to cheat or not cheat, steal or not steal, lie or not lie, help or not help, hurt or not hurt. And how do people do? And did they, if they acted well, what, in, what uh, situations did they act well in? They didn't act well, which situations did they not act well in? What variables seem to influence their behavior and would be important predictors for good or bad behavior? There's no way I can get into all that here. And you don't want me to. I mean, that would just be, it would be uh, yeah, too much. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just give you a quick example from research on helping and another example from research on cheating. So please, when I say this is just a quick overview, please note that I've got a lot more studies that I could draw from. And there's no way just from these two examples that I would ever make a grandiose conclusion like most of us do not have the virtues on the basis of two studies. This is just by way of illustration. The first one is from 1969. It's one of the most famous studies in the history of psychology, the lady in distress study. I'm sorry, I ahead of myself. So here's how it goes. You are a participant in the study. You volunteer to, to participate. You come into the lab. You're told you need to fill out a survey. So you say, sure. You go into a room. You're given the survey and a pen or pencil to fill out the survey. You're left alone. You're working on the survey. A few minutes later, the person in charge comes back with a stranger who looks like another participant who's given the same survey, uh, told to sit down and is working away next to you on the survey. A few minutes later, the person in charge seems to have an accident, an emergency arises. She's in the next room. She's not with you in your room. She's in the next room. And then if the participants, now we'll pick up on this quote here, if they were listening carefully, participants heard her climb up on a chair to get a book from the top shelf. Even if they were not listening carefully, they heard a loud crash and a woman scream as the chair fell over. Oh my God, my foot, cried the representative. I, I can't move it. Oh my ankle, I can't, can't get this thing off me. 
Okay, so clearly, clearly it sounds like something as bad is happening in the next row. So ask yourself again, I'm gonna have a lot of these questions to, to be introspective. What would you do? That was you, if you were in that situation. Well, you, you know, you, I bet everyone's gonna say, of course I would do something to help. I might yell out, I might get up out of my seat and run into the next room, do something to be helpful because clearly this person is in need. And the answer, as far as the study is concerned is, well, it depends. The one thing it really depends upon is whether that stranger in the room helps or not. If that stranger in the room with you doesn't do anything, it's very likely that you will not do anything yourself. So suppose that the participant in the, is in the room with another survey taker and this person doesn't do anything to help. Okay. Well, what were the results in that variation? Here we go. 7% of participants helped. It's not 70, that's 7%. That means 93% did not help. That is quite stunning. And it mattered that the survey um, was done with a stranger because in another variation where there was no stranger present with you or with the participants, 70% helped. So in the alone condition, 70% helped. In the non-responsive stranger condition, 7% helped. Huge difference. Okay. And it's not just this particular study. Uh, it's not like isolated to this particular one. It's been replicated many times. There's also been a number of variations. So hearing a man have an epileptic seizure, meaning his worker fall off a ladder, man cry in pain from what seemed to be serious electric shocks, uh, a stream of smoke coming into the room where one or more participants are seated. So that's, that's very strange. People don't do anything when it, the room is starting to fill up with smoke. Watching a thief steal cash from a receptionist envelope. Observing young men steal a case of beer from a discount store, and the, maybe the worst one of all, hearing a bully beat up a child. So this is a, an example of the group effect or the bystander effect. Uh, it's become kind of wildly known in our culture today. Uh, it's, it's been replicated many times, as I've said, and it's not very admirable. And this result, uh, to me, does not reflect what I would think of as a compassionate person's behavior. Maybe for the 7%, but not for the remaining 93%. Okay. Moving on, here's another study. That first one was about helping, or as the case might be, not helping. This one here is very different. First of all, it's much more contemporary, as you can see, 2011. Secondly, it has to do with cheating as opposed to helping. And thirdly, it has to do with many uh, students at a university and whether they cheated or not. So here's the setup. Each participant completed a worksheet with 20 problems. They would be paid 50 cents per correct answer. And in the control condition, participants knew that the experimenter checked answers and oversaw payments. Okay. So there, in this, the idea here is that in this version, there was no opportunity to cheat. Uh, you could, um, you would just be paid exactly based upon your performance on the test. But there was another variation where different participants, so there's no overlap here, just to make sure we're not confused about the setup here. In this setup, basically what happened is that you got the opportunity to cheat if you wanted to, and you would get away with it, no questions asked. So your worksheets would be shredded. You would just tell the experimenter how you did. There would never be any questions asked about like, are you sure about that? Or, you know, can you double check again? You could cheat with abandon and get away with it if you so choose. Or not, of course, no one's saying you have to cheat. It's your choice. Well, did that make a difference? Let's see, um, that's not the actual shredder that was used, but um, there's a picture of a shredder. In the no opportunity to cheat variation, on that eight problems were answered correctly. So that gives us our baseline. At this point in a, in a live talk, I would, uh, in person, I would ask you, well, what do you think is gonna happen in the shredder condition? Is it gonna be about the same? Is it gonna be about a little bit higher, a lot higher? Of course, I've already kind of primed you to think that it's not gonna be very good the results are going to be depressing, right? So lo and behold, they are. In the opportunity to cheat condition, 13 problems answered correctly. I should have put that in uh, quotation marks because I think it's very clear that they were not all answered correctly. Maybe this group was so smart and brilliant that they like just performed better, but um, I would not bet on that. In fact, uh, if you believe that, I've got a lot of other things I could sell you too. So 
I think we know what was going on here. People were taking advantage of the opportunity to cheat. Okay, this also doesn't look very positive to me. It doesn't reflect very well on our character. When given the opportunity to cheat, people took advantage of it. An honest person would not do that. All right, again, now that's just two examples, two illustrations. I've, I've, you know, I've digested hundreds of studies in moral psychology like these. And what I've concluded is that the experimental evidence does not show the patterns of virtuous behavior and virtuous motivation that I would expect if we were virtuous people. Okay, so I concluded most of us are not good people, which is, as I said already, what I would have predicted from Christianity uh, anyway. Um, so let me just do one modification here uh, to this video display to make it a little easier for me. Okay, to be able to see the whole text and then we're good. So I argued this in uh, quite some length in two books that are for an academic audience, uh, Moral Character and Empirical Theory, 2013, and Character and Moral Psychology, 2014. So if you really wanna dive into this, the empirical evidence, have at it, um, those are the places to go that I uh, try to make my case. So what we're left with, and I say, is that most of us have a character gap, um, a gap between our actual character and the virtuous character which we should possess. So there's a significant space empirically between how we actually are, which is not virtuous, and how we should be, which is virtuous. And that character gap is what became the, the title of the book that Jeff referred to, uh, which is a, a trade book, a, a book written for a general audience um, called The Character Gap. All right. Happy to explore that in a lot more detail if you like. I also um, don't think most of us are vicious. So you could think that the conclusion is therefore we're kind of rotten people full of vice. I don't think that's true either. And I'd be happy to expand on why I think that and, and say a lot more in the question and answer. All right. So I could just end here. I could, could stop the talk. It would be a pretty short talk. Uh, it would also be a kind of, you know, not a very great note to send you off on. Uh, we're not very good people. See you later. Uh, have a good rest of the day. But, um, what I want to do now is say that, well, there is some room for optimism. Even if we're not virtuous people, we're not stuck with the character we have. Character is malleable. It can change. It can improve. Of course, it can get worse as well. But um, the good news is that we can improve our character but on our own, in the community, and maybe also through divine means, which I'll get to, into at the end. So in part three now, I want to look at real quickly three secular strategies for improving character. And then in part four, I'll look at a few Christian ideas as well, if we have time. So now the idea is let's see that, confront that character gap. Let's acknowledge that we have it and what can we do in our daily lives to try and bridge it or at least reduce it, shrink that character gap so that character better reflects the character we're supposed to have or should have in the first place. First strategy I want to recommend to you is what I call moral reminders. And so the idea is that during our day-to-day -day life, we often get sidetracked by other things besides what we should be focusing on. We get sidetracked by temptations, by things that are in our immediate self-interest, give us pleasure in the moment, but may lead us astray. So the idea here is that moral reminders can help us get back on track. They can make our moral commitments more salient, more fresh, more vivid in our minds, and work against our solely pursuing our own self-interest. And they can include things like uh, starting your day with a reading, uh, whether secular reading or religious reading, um, spending time in prayer uh, from a Christian perspective or other religious perspectives, uh, uh, ending your day by journaling or reflecting on your day and what's, where areas where you could improve, um, getting regular text messages or emails with important reminders in them. Well, there are lots of ways this could go. I wanna give you one illustration. It's one that's very um, near and dear to my heart uh, about honesty and the honor code. And as a professor, of course, I care a lot about cheating and not cheating, and honesty and honor codes. Uh, it's also gonna tie into that example we had earlier of the study with the shredder. So I think it's an, it does lots of uh, good work. This example. So let's go back to that shredder study again, but now with a different researcher from 2008 who had the same kind of idea, 
50 cents per correct answer. Control condition, this is a different test question. So you can see this was a harder test. Only 3.4 out of 20 problems answered correctly. They had a shredder condition too, 6.1 out of 20. So it looks like there was some cheating going on. Now they had a third condition. And in the third condition, the students who are participating in the study first had to sign their university's honor code. And then they took this, the tests where they were given the opportunity to cheat. Look what happened. The shredder plus the honor code condition, cheating seems to have disappeared. What if we up the stakes? $2 per correct answer. Control condition, about the same, no change there, you wouldn't expect. Shredder condition, higher, um, but not dramatic. What about the honor code? Same thing. Honor code brings back the performance, seems like, to what it's supposed to be without any cheating going on at the group level. Okay. So why do I bring this up? How is it relevant? Well, this is a very tangible illustration of the idea of a moral reminder. What the honor code does is function as a moral reminder to get people, in this case, students, to pay attention to what matters, honor, integrity, honesty, prior to taking a test where they have an opportunity to do something morally wrong. And lo and behold, they don't. I think it's really interesting. Uh, honor codes have lots of other effects. Um, it's been pretty well documented. 28% uh, versus 9% when it comes to helping another person on a test, plagiarism, unauthorized crib notes, and unpermitted collaboration. So um, really uh, anyone who's in the education world, I think it'd be great to have a further conversation and hope that your school uh, already has an honor code and uh, pays attention to it in a robust way. All right, um, moving on in the interest of time, I wanna do two more strategies from a secular perspective. Second one is called what I call role models. Well, kind of gives it away. There's one role model. We all know Abraham Lincoln and honesty. There's another role model, Harriet Tubman and courage. Here's a third role model, Leopold Socha and compassion. Not widely known, so let me mention him a little bit more. This was someone who during World War II was in charge of the sewer system in a small town in Poland. When the Nazis invaded, he was able to hide 20 Jews in the sewer system before the Nazis were able to take them away. The Nazi occupation lasted over a year. And so every day he had to crawl on his hands and knees through the filthy wastes of the sewer system to bring food and water to those 20 Jews hiding in, this, in, in, uh, in his system, the sewer system. After the, uh, the, the, the Russians uh, liberated the town, 10 of the 20 were able to, to survive and emerged from the sewer system. So he's able to say, to say 10 Jews who would otherwise have died. Incredible story, highly recommend uh, investigating and looking into it in more detail. So I think uh, definitely a, a role model for something like compassion. All right, now what's this have to do with our character growth? Well, when we see role models like this, we can admire them. Hopefully we do admire them. And not just at a distance, like I admire the performance of the US team on some Olympic events, but I'm never gonna be participating in that Olympic event. No, it's not just admiring at a distance, it's admiring them in such a way that I'm inspired by them. I move powerfully by them to want to be more like them in the relevant respects. Maybe not President of the United States, um, in the case of Lincoln, but in the relevant respects when it comes to something like honesty, being like him in that respect. Okay, so practically speaking in our lives, the, the idea is to seek out virtuous role models, exemplars, okay? And that could take the form of historical ones like the ones I just gave you. It could take the form of contemporary ones like in, prominent in our society or maybe even better, ones who are close to us in our lives, friends, family members, colleagues, neighbors, who on a day-to-day -day basis can role model what it's like to live this certain way and make it very vivid and tangible for us. Um, to make this a little bit uh, uh, more concrete as well, um, if you're in the education world and you have students or you just uh, 
you know, your parents and, and you're thinking about how this might be applicable in your in the life of your children. One idea is to have actually have students research and if it's a real person in their surrounding environment, inter even interview a relevant and attainable exemplar of a particular virtue, uh, virtue I'm sorry. Uh, could be courage, could be any virtue. With an emphasis on the student's emotional responses to learning about the exemplar's courage. Okay. So some factors which seem to matter a lot to how impactful this can be. Is it relevant? Is the exemplar relevant? Is the exemplar attainable? So relevant to our own personal lives, our personal situation, what we're struggling with. Is it someone who we think we can become more like? Or is this person so above us, so perfect, that is almost discouraging because it seems like the person's character is unattainable for us? And is there an emotional connection that can be fostered to that person? So that's the second idea is in our lives and also in the lives of people we care about, like uh, students or family members, children and the like, seek out and admire and ultimately emulate or imitate virtuous role models who are doing better in some area of their lives than we are doing in the corresponding area of our life. Okay, third one, from a secular perspective, I'm gonna call identifying character flaws. Kind of gives it away here as well. So the way I put it is on the slide, develop a greater understanding about our own character flaws and limitations. Okay, that makes kind of intuitive, makes sense. Um, pretty, pretty obvious. But in particular, influences, learn about situational influence, environmental influences, cognitive biases that we, that can encourage non-virtuous behavior and serve as psychological impediments to virtue. So some of our flaws are obvious. Some of our flaws may be less obvious, are a bit under the radar screen of our conscious awareness. So it's important to do some digging and unlock them and become more aware of them so that we can work against them. And as that's the idea, so in the situations in which they might be activated, we can work to compensate for or correct them. Okay, this is piggybacking on the idea that some of our character flaws are not transparent to us, and not immediately consciously accessible to us. And so we should do something about that, become aware of them and work against them. That's pretty abstract, I know, so let me try to illustrate. And this will tie into the first study we had, the study where there was no helping when a stranger wasn't helping. So the bystander effect on helping. So a study uh, in the 1970s by Beeman and colleagues took this idea and tried to test it. So here they had students hear a social psychology lecture explaining how groups can inhibit helping. So kind of educating these students about this phenomenon, the students presumably didn't know anything about it before. Did that make a difference? Well, only one way to find out, or at least maybe the best way to find out is to actually have an emergency situation and see what, see what unfolded. Did the behavior improve or not? So that's what they did. Later that day, they set up a staged emergency and saw whether these students behaved well or not. And lo and behold, 67% of the students helped, which is astounding. Okay. Even when there was a non-responsive bystander. Remember, it was 7% in the original study I gave you. <clears throat> Only 27% of controls do not hear the lecture helped. Okay, so a little bit higher in this group uh, versus the 7%. But still, the main takeaway is, look, big difference from learning about the lecture, learning about this, learning from the lecture about this phenomenon to subsequent helping behavior. They might say, well, of course, that's just later in the day, if it's fresh in our minds, you know, no surprise. So they also did another variation where it was two weeks later. Did the, the lecture have an impact even that much later in time? And it did. 42.5% helps versus only 25% of controls helps. Not as big, of course, not as pronounced, but still that's a significant effect. If, if my lectures had that effect on my students, I would be overjoyed um, and I'd be thrilled. And that's probably the, uh, other, other faculty out there would agree with me. So um, that's something to take, keep in mind. And it's an illustration of this idea of the impact of learning about some of our flaws and deficiencies to work against them when the time comes. All right, okay. 
I think I do have some time for our last section, and I promise this is the last section. So thank you for bearing with me. Part four, what are some Christian strategies for developing better character? Seems appropriate I should talk about this in this kind of setting uh, for an event sponsored by the Henry Center. Uh, let me say as a preliminary, I, when I'm talking about this, I don't mean to say that there are not valuable strategies from other religious perspectives. There certainly are. I just don't have time to talk about them today in 10 minutes. Uh, I also don't mean to say that someone who is not religious at all can't be a good person. I think that's false. There are examples of plenty of people who are not religious who have a good moral character. Okay, so I don't think it's necessary, um, but I think, as we'll see as we go along, that Christian strategies can certainly help and are, have valuable contributions to make. So, with those preliminaries out of the way, I'm going to introduce three ideas from a Christian perspective about how to foster a good character. The first has to do with, well, just Christian rituals and practices, things that Christians uh, engage with in a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis, which may not have character improvement front and center, but can impact character as a byproduct or side effect. Okay, so what do I mean here? These are practices that are direct our attention to what's good moral considerations, oriented our motives in the right way, things like praying. Contemplating scripture in the lives of the saints, fasting, confessing sins, tithing to the church, ministering to the poor and needy. Okay. Now, again, those may not have our own character improvement as the goal. In fact, it would kind of be weird, I think maybe a little bit uh, disturbing if that was the goal all the time. When you're ministering to the poor, you should be focused on ministering to the poor, not on how does this make me better, make me a better person. That would be uh, wrong kind of reason, bad focus, bad motive. However, as in ministering to the poor, one can also grow in something like compassion as a byproduct or side effect. And so the idea is that you no know, one one off. This isn't maybe going to have much of an impact, but through repeated practice over weeks, months, years, these behaviors can become automatic, help to override temptation, and gradually increase levels of virtue. So to take just a couple of them real quickly, something like Christian prayer can be relevant to combating lots of things. I'll just give a couple examples, pride, arrogance, and conceit, and fostering humility, proper obedience, and love. Confessing sins, uh, in this, these two uh, examples on the left-hand side, there's the current Pope in that famous picture in which he, he was having confession uh, with a you know, quote unquote ordinary priest uh, who was the hearing the confession of the most influential um, Christian person in the world today. On the right-hand side, you see, well, I mean, I don't know what you see, maybe two ghosts uh, hanging out there, uh, but I think you can see what, the, what I had in mind with that. Two people in general abstracted away from the particulars, sharing something very personal with each other. So this kind of confession, whether, whether it takes a form of Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, whether it takes the form of with a, a priest or with a friend or with, directly with God. I'm not uh, you know, recommending any of those over the other. I'm just talking about in general, can be relevant to combating pride, intemperance, cowardice, excessive guilt and excessive shame and fostering humility, gratitude, temperance, courage and forgiveness. Tithing to the church, same kind of thing, uh, combating greed, selfishness, stinginess and pride and fostering gratitude, generosity, humility and benefit. So hopefully that idea makes sense. And moving on to the second one. Now, the way that the first idea was unpacked, it was all individualistic. Mm -hmm. What can I do to make myself a better person from a Christian perspective? And if I do these things, maybe I'll grow in virtue. But I think that leaves out a really important dimension, which is the social dimension, the communal dimension, the church dimension. So I think all these practices are often carried out and maybe should be carried out liturgically in a social context. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, I think for this audience, I don't need to say much, but just to expand a little bit, uh, Christians pray together. They read scripture together. They confess together. They even discipline each other together. It's not just I'm on my own with no one to help me. 
uh, know we are part of a larger group. And this can be relevant in all kinds of ways, which I can't unpack here, but just to briefly mention a few. Uh, so Christians can benefit from the social dimension, from the advice of others, the experiences that others have had, the wisdom and teachings of others, the example of their lives, their mistakes, of course, uh, benefit from seeing other people's mistakes and learning from them, and their warnings, too. <laughs> uh, just a quick aside here, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, one of the most famous uh, examples of character growth and from a Christian perspective uh, has to do with the Desert Fathers in the early years of Christianity. And this might seem like, well, this is not social at all. This is anything but social. So how, are you, how Miller, are you recommending this idea of the importance of character growth in a social community when some of the most famous people in the early history of the church were there people like this, St. Simeon? who sat on a pillar, erected with a small platform at the top. Upon this, he determined to wake up, to take up his abode until death released him. At first, it was a little more than nine feet high, but it subsequently was replaced by others, and the last in a series being approximately over 50 feet from the ground. But even then, in this kind of example, even then, I'll say, uh, he was a exemplary person uh, for character growth including an exemplary person in his social interaction with others. So even on the highest of his columns, Simeon was not withdrawn from intercourse with his fellow men by means of a ladder, which could always be erected against the side. Visitors were able to ascend, and we know that he wrote letters, the text of some of which we possess. He instructed disciples, and he also delivered addresses to those assembled. Okay. Now, um, a quick uh, aside. Um, this is very much related, uh, something we can uh, definitely talk about more in, in the Q&A, uh, but um, it's not a third idea. I'm going to say that third idea from a Christian perspective in a moment. The first idea, again, is so Christian rituals and practices. The second idea is the carrying out of those practices and rituals in a social community. The third idea is going to be the Holy Spirit, but before we get to that, there's a, always this question of, was well, there any backing for this? Is there any su support for this? Any data to back up the claim that it actually works? And I wanna say here, just, just, uh, just as uh, a quick preview, I think there is some data, but it's not conclusive. There's some suggestive data, but we have to also recognize its limitations. I'll we'll give you a couple examples from uh, empirical studies that are published in you know, peer-reviewed journals. Those who regularly attended religious services were 25% more likely to give than those who did rarely or said that they were not religious. They were also 23% more likely to volunteer. And in 2000, they gave away 3.5 times more money per year. And then look at the amounts. 2,210 versus 642, and volunteered more than twice as much, 12 times versus 5.8 times. Okay, that's from Brooks' work, Arthur Brooks. Uh, different studies um, from different researchers, measures of religiosity have been significantly linked to reduced rates of suicide, lower drug use, increased healthcare utilization, reduced smoking, reduced alcohol abuse, living healthier lifestyles, the promotion of mental health, and even mortality rates. Uh, and I'm not going to be able to go through and tell you the, the particular numbers for each of these. These are just summary observations. And religion was as powerful a predictor of subjective well-being as marital and work status and education, and various measures of religiosity correlated with satisfaction with family life, finances, friendships, and health. So I uh, wrote an article in 2012, reviewing a lot of this in some detail in the uh, Character Gap book, which has already been mentioned a couple of times. I go through this as well if you want references, or you can just email me and I'd be happy to send you some specific citations if you want to track them down and dig into the data some more. One more slide on this. So particular sociologists Ellison and Anderson Found that based on self reports, men who attended religious services once a week or more are 60% less likely than non tenders to commit the domestic violence. That is by itself, you know, that's just self report. It's not, I don't know if we want to make too much of that. But for partner reports, 
the percentage of domestic violence is 48.7% higher in the non attending um, And then one more religious involvement was associated with subsequent higher parental education law expectations, more extensive communication with parents about schooling, advanced math course credits, time spent on homework, and successful degree completion, as well as avoiding cutting classes. So this is a wide variety of different pieces of evidence. Of course, it's uh, very quick. Um, and I think we should also be cautious about jumping to too, um, too much of a conclusion from it for two reasons, which I'll mention. First, this is just correlational research. So as we all know, the slogan, <coughs> cor is, uh, correlation is not causation. So it doesn't show that the religiosity actually caused the good effects. It could go the other way around. And secondly, it doesn't tell us about motivation. So even if there is uh, good evidence of improved behavior, that's not the same thing as improved character automatically, unless we get into the motivation, unpack some of that and see whether it's virtuous as well. And happy to talk more about that though. And I think it's very, very interesting and important work that I hope to actually in the coming years get more into in my own research. All right, so I'm coming up on the time uh, that I was told to respect. And I just have one more idea to mention. So I think we're in good shape. Here's the third and final idea. So the first two ideas about the social practices, I'm sorry, about the, uh, the practices and rituals, and also about the community, engaging with others in community, I highlight them from a Christian perspective, but they're also, of course, translatable into other religious perspectives, Judaism, Christianity, as well, for instance. There is an idea that is specific to Christianity that I also uh, think is very, very, very important to character improvements. I think it's a good one to end with as well, the role of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> for it is God who works in you, inspiring both the will and the deed for his own chosen purpose. <clears throat> so the idea here is that from, from a, for those who, who are watching or maybe not as familiar with this, Christianity throughout its history has claimed that the Holy Spirit is active, as Holy Spirit being one of the three members of the Trinity, one of the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is active in the life of the Christian believer to causally influence or affect the process of character development and sanctification. So what does that mean? Well, it means lots of things, but one thing it means is that from a Christian perspective, Christians are not left to their own devices to grow in character, not just individually as opposed to in society, but I mean, not just left to their own devices as human beings, thankfully. Because if we leave things up to human beings, things tend to go wrong uh, in the short run or especially in the long run. So here, the, the, the emphasis I wanna place on the Holy Spirit is God's intervening in the process to assist to be there with us in some form or other throughout the process of character improvement. Not uh, completely, I'm sorry, uh, not completely maybe in this life, maybe it's not gonna be completely finished. Maybe we won't have a perfect character or a fully virtuous character at the end of this life. But uh, the idea being that we're moving along a certain trajectory. Maybe that process needs to be finished in the next life, but it's moving along a, cer a certain trajectory in this life. For example, the Holy Spirit may work to address the deepest recesses of the Christian's mind and weaken the influence of non-virtuous tendencies. Alternatively, it may provide an inspirational role, uh, inspire us to change and, be, and grow more. It may unite us with God's love in a certain way. There are lots of different theories about how this works, which we won't get into, at least in this, in this slide, um, lots of different mechanisms whereby this is supposed to be accomplished. Um, but the main takeaway I just want to emphasize for today is uh, we're not left to our own devices. God and human beings are working together throughout the long process of, of developing a good, virtuous character. There's a divine companion, and, and it's, a, uh, it's a relationship. Uh, so that's the, the final thing I want to leave, uh, leave us with. 
as we end that. And I'll uh, wrap up with just three questions that I want to, uh, I think are good to, to pose and ask for you to, to reflect upon. What do you think? Do any of these strategies sound promising to you? Uh, if so, which ones? And if so, if not, which ones do not sound promising? So maybe you like some of them, maybe you don't like others. I'd love to hear both which ones you like, which ones you don't like. Are there other promising approaches besides these? And here the answer is certainly yes, and I you know, very much welcome them and love to hear and learn from you about what those promising approaches might be. And then finally, last for today, what might you do? What might I do? What might we all do? practically in our own lives to become more virtuous people. Okay. So taking this from the realm of academic and the intellectual and the headspace and trying to make it practical and applicable and tangible, what can we do leaving this time together to adjust or change how we live our lives to become more virtuous people, right? And with that, I will say thank you. Um, the book has a lot more discussion if you're interested. And I look forward to our discussion right now. Thank you, uh, Christian, for that challenging talk. Now is the time in our event for a panel discussion and audience interaction. I invite all of you, our audience, to ask your questions. You'll see the link in the Q&A um, functionality down below. Please add your own questions or mark up questions of others that you'd really like us to address. Uh, and as you're formulating your questions, let me just briefly uh, reintroduce you to our panelists for today. Uh, joining Christian, we have uh, Max Lee, Professor of New Testament at North Park University. Thanks for waving, Max. Paul Nadaleski, Assistant Director at the Institute uh, for Advanced Studies and Culture, as well as Oliver O'Donovan, Meritus Professor of Christian Ethics and Practical Theology at the University of Edinburgh. Also joining us today is our guest moderator, Josh Jipp, Professor of New Testament here at TEDS. Uh, so Josh, over to you. Christian, thanks so much for a wonderful talk. There's so many uh, interesting points of intersection with Christian theology, pastoral ministry, and uh, even beyond. So I'm looking forward to uh, giving an opportunity for both our panelists to uh, raise questions, uh, make points. I also wanna make sure we're able to uh, uh, get in uh, some of our audience uh, questions as well. So thank you very much, Christian. Maybe let me just start with uh, a, qu a question from the audience, if I'm understanding it rightly. Um, when empirical studies are done on virtue that uh, engage, uh, you know, uh, how are religious people uh, virtuous? Are they more or less virtuous? Does this, is this basically monitoring different, different traditions? Is it any form of transcendence uh, that they have some notion that goes beyond them or are there certain controls that are in place that may, uh, uh, may give us a more precise uh, depiction? Yeah, great question. Um, so first of all, let me say a quick word about Josh. Uh, so for everyone listening, uh, I just wanna first thank you for moderating this and secondly, tell everyone that Josh's new book just released today, if, I, if I'm right. Uh, yeah, you don't so, have to do that, but thanks. No, I, well, it's too late, you can't yeah. go back now. All it's right, recorded all right. for, all, for all eternity. Um, and so after this talk is over, you go out and buy his new book. Um, so that's, <clears throat> thank you to the audience member who raised that question. That's a great question. The answer is that it, it depends. I mean, there, there, there are hundreds of studies in this, on this particular topic as well. And they're using all kinds of different approaches. Uh, one, you know, complicating factor is sometimes they are trying to pick out Christian participants. Sometimes they're just focusing on religious participants and not trying to distinguish between say Christians or Jews or, or Muslims. Uh, another complicating factor is how do they measure religiosity? Uh, it could be everything from just self-report, how religious do you think you are? Uh, to uh, what are more commonly or maybe more uh, widely employed and respected measures, things like um, frequency of prayer during the week and frequency of religious attendance at some kind of service uh, and uh, strength of belief. 
Um, so those are, those are the three, I would say, widely used measures of religiosity. Again, um, frequency of prayer, frequency of attendance at uh, religious uh, uh, service of some kind um, or event, and uh, self-reported strength of belief. Now, you know, no measure is perfect here, and you could already imagine what some limitations are of those and some problems, um, but that's, that's what's uh, most widely used. Great. Let me, let me get in one more question, then I'm going to uh, move to the panelists for a second. But Christian, could you also expand a little bit on vice? What do you mean when you, you, you demonstrated the ambiguity of our moral character, but you also said people are not vicious? Could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, sorry. I, I kind of skated right over that. I apologize that I didn't say more about it. So let me say something about the concept of vice and then say something about the empirical side too. So on the concept, what is a vice? I think you can actually take what I said about virtue and just invert it. So a vice is going to be a character trait as well. It's going to be stable over time. You can't be a vicious person if it's just a one-off. It's gonna be stable over time. It's gonna be consistent across situations as well. So a dishonest person is not just dishonest in the courtroom, the dishonest in the courtroom, dishonest at the party, dishonest at the office, dishonest at home. Uh, it's going to have a motivational component as well as a behavioral component. But the key thing is that it's orientated in the opposite direction of a virtue. So psychologically, it functions in lots of, of the same ways, behaviorally and, and motivationally, but the orientation is the opposite. So instead of you know, being oriented towards helping someone, you're indifferent to help towards helping someone. Instead of being oriented towards the truth, you're oriented towards your own advantage, which may come at the expense of the truth. I mean, it may become an, when uh, you see an opportunity to cheat, lie, or steal, you're indifferent to the truth if it's uh, to your own advantage. So that's a little bit on the conceptual side as, as to how I'm thinking of them. Uh, as far as the empirical side goes, well, you know, here we enter into lots of different controversies. Uh, you know, you might think from a Christian perspective, and certainly some theologians have thought this, that the correct view, biblically or theologically, um, is that most of us are vicious people, that we're totally depraved, that we are um, vicious through and through, or at least pretty darn bad. Um, and I'm, I'm not the expert here. I've deferred to, to the people on the panel um, to say what, how prevalent that interpretation is and whether it's defensible on, on New Testament grounds or not. What I will say to end uh, my uh, response here is the empirical data from psychology, in my mind, tells a story whereby we are not vicious, most of us. So, I keep on using this phrase, most of us. I think there's a bell curve here. I think most of us are in what I'll call a murky middle or middle grounds where we have a mixed trait, a mixed character of good and bad. Of course, there are some vicious people. To pick your favorite example, your Hitler, your Stalin, whatever. I say there are also some virtuous people. Pick your favorite example there. Jesus, you know, I, I talked about uh, Abraham Lincoln, Harry Tubman, and so forth. I think most of us have a character which you can say you know, is, is a mixed bag. And so it's, it's better than vicious. That's kind of a, you know, positive spin on it, but worse than virtuous. Why do I think that? Um, well, I didn't give you any studies to really support this claim. So you're just gonna have to, you know, I guess to take, take me my word for it, that this is, this is supported, at least can be, a case can be made for it. But I see plenty of studies where in particular situations, people behave admirably. They step up to the plate. They do the right thing. They tell the truth, even though they had an opportunity to not tell, to tell a lie. They help, even though there's not clear they're gonna have a self-benefit from it. In particular, I'm really impressed by research on empathy, which suggests that people who experience the emotion of empathy are much more likely to help others when they're in empathetic state of mind, others who are suffering, and do for, so for selfless, altruistic motives. That's not what I would expect of a vicious person. So I'll stop there. Happy to say more though. Great, thank you, Christian. Uh, panelists, um, anyone wanna jump in with a question or comment? Paul, go ahead. Thanks, Paul. Joshua. 
Christian, thanks for a, a great and engaging talk. Um, I, uh, like you, you know, so, some of the empirical results were less surprising because of, you know, my commitment as, as, a, as a Christian. Um, but I was curious, you know, I, plenty of people have a different view. They, they assume that human beings are mostly good. Uh, and I'm wondering what, do you have a beat on what the, is there a general reaction to the, these studies that you're, that you're seeing from people who have this sort of opposite expectation? Do they, do they find the empirical results uh, pretty compelling? Does it change their mind? Um, if not, you know, how do they, how do they push back? And I'm just curious, what is for the choir, um, what's the reaction if there's any yeah. sort of standard one? Yeah, great, great, great question. Um, so I, I think, first of all, a uh, couple points here. First one is that you're right that many people have a positive view about their own character and about other people's character. And there's empirical data to back that up. So when you give surveys to people, self-report surveys, so self-assessment surveys, you know, rate your character from one to five with one being poor character and five being very good character, or rate your character from one, I mean, rate a particular character trait like honesty or compassion or courage. Uh, how do you do on those character traits? People often give themselves about a four out of five. So a pretty po positive, they're, they're, they're not willing to typically go like super high. There's a little bit of humility there, I guess. Um, but definitely a positive spin. And this has been cross-culturally validated. It's not just unique to Americans. So, and then you see this in particular studies as well, when you ask people beforehand, what do you expect is going to happen in this study? And often the expectation is the participants will behave well. So in the famous Milgram studies, for example, from the 1960s, where, you know, shocking, well, shocking in lots of different ways, one of which is that participants <laughs> under pressure from an authority figure, turned up a dial more and more, uh, giving a more and more electric shocks to an innocent person in the next room. Um, this was uh, you know, very, very surprising to people. When you asked people ahead of time who were not part of the study, what do you expect will happen in this situation? They're, they're, these people say, no one would shock, or very few people would turn up the shock dial very far Lo and behold, in fact, over 60% of the participants in the Milgram study turned up the shock dial to the lethal level, XXX, effectively killing an innocent person in that famous study. Um, so that's support for the first part of your remarks. Now, the second part of what you said was, well, how do people react afterwards when they're confronted with some of this data, which maybe is more sobering? Um, I don't have studies on the tip of my tongue there, if, I'm not sure of how many have been done. I only have more anecdotal uh, uh, data to offer you. What, what has been, you know, the response when I presented this and other people have presented this data. Um, I find it that uh, often audience members are willing to self-correct to some extent, to, to bring down their, their self-assessment, um, to, to in, front, in, in light of the evidence to make, to have a more balanced and what I would call it kind of mixed assessments of how good they are and how good other people are. Uh, not in every case, of course. And some people actually push back at me and, and keep on trying to defend widespread virtue. Uh, but in general, I would say uh, uh, the reception has been open-minded. May I come in on the experimental, the empirical experiments? Please do. Please do. Um, I am in among the many fascinating questions that um, Christian Miller has raised in my mind. One is, and one of the ones that I'm most troubled by, is what these experiments to the, demonstrate our general non-virtuousness actually are testing for. Now, if you stage an emergency, are you not testing for the virtue of decisive reaction to an emergency, rather than testing for the virtue of, say, compassion, which uh, Christian Miller was talking about. Um, if you place people in situations where they are insecure about their own and other people's roles in a situation, are you not testing for a quite very specific capacity 
to uh, as it were, overrule role expectations and step in in a decisive way. Um, and are you perhaps not testing also for the capacity to exercise caution in situations where you don't quite understand what is going on? Um, so, I mean, I, what I don't know from any of the experiments that have been told to us this afternoon or described to us this afternoon is whether they're actually testing for virtue. Virtue in the most general sense or specific virtues of courage, compassion or whatever, or whether they're testing simply for this particular gene in virtue, which is the ability to completely reconstruct a situation very fast and act sharply. Now, if virtues are, are as Christian Miller has said, um, multi-situational and shown not only in the classroom, but also in the home situation, not only in um, emergencies, but also in long drawn out tragedies, must not testing for virtue also be multi-situation. So that particularly these ones in which college students are signed up for a, an experiment and put in a classroom and given a questionnaire and so on, really aren't going to show us very much about their virtues. Very good, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm, I'm actually quite sympathetic to, to what you said. Uh, I, um, I would never want to infer from one study that there's lack of virtue. So, you know, the, the, uh, the shoe study I gave you on cheating, I would not conclude from that that therefore most people are dishonest or at least, I'm sorry, not honest. Similarly, the 1969 Lady in Distress study, I would not infer from that that most people are not compassionate. That would just be, just be terrible, terrible reasoning. Um, you're also right to say that the best kind of studies are longitudinal studies. By that, I mean studies which take the same people and observe how they behave in a variety of different circumstances and monitor them over time. Not just how they behave on a test, but then, okay, how do they um, cheat you know, or, or lie to their friends at the dining hall? Um, do they plagiarize a, a, on a paper for a professor? No, you know, hopefully never, um, but it happens. So monitoring that same cohort or group over time and you know, without them knowing or at least so long as they acted naturally would be the best way to go about assessing people's character. Unfortunately, there are some real practical limitations to doing that. Uh, so there are almost no studies which carry out that methodology, um, which is the best methodology for sure. Um, it's, they're very expensive to run. Uh, they're, um, they're kind of invasive. And also um, there's questions about whether people would, would act in a fake manner, knowing that they're Part of a study and they're being monitored over the course of days or weeks. So, well, how, where does this leave me? Where, what I say is, um, first of all, on a particular topic like cheating, I don't want to look at one particular study. I want to look at all the studies that have been done on cheating, aggregate them, okay, and see what the general pattern of behavior is. And if what we find in the general pattern of behavior in the, across those studies is not the general pattern of behavior I would expect from an honest person, then I think we've got a question about whether most people are honest. So if we do, you know, we have a hundred studies and over and over and over again, when people had an opportunity to cheat and get away with it, we find them cheating. That just doesn't align with the empirical prediction I would have expected if most people are honest. Okay, that's the kind of, of argument I, I'm, I'm running here. Um, but I, I think I want to accept most of your points, um, at least if not all your points, uh, and still try to make my case for lack of virtue on the basis of the experimental data. Oliver, did you want to uh, respond to that or move to another question? Um, well, I do have other questions, but I don't want to hog the um, conversation. I, 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 I mean, Christian Miller's um, answer to me there, which was very helpful, I think, um, simply raises the question whether it's possible to design an experiment 
that actually tests for what we want to test. That is one possible truth about the matter is that the sort of empirical experimental model that is appropriate, say, for testing drugs or testing other things is not actually going to be much use. And that reading biographies and histories and actually following some of the more traditional ways in which the human race has very carefully monitored itself um, on and its behavior may actually inform us better. Good. That's the only suspicion I'm, I'm, I'm left with. That the, there's something about this uh, empirical experiment model which is going to be distorting. And if that's the case, then it doesn't really matter how many of the um, experiments you read up, and I'm sure uh, Christian has read up large numbers, uh, but they're all going to have some of the same bias. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Um, again, I think I want to largely agree with you. So I don't want this experimental approach to be exclusive. I, you know, it's an approach I've adopted, but I think it's complementary to other approaches. So I certainly welcome biographical approaches, historical approaches, theological approaches, contemporary political approaches, um, anthropological approaches. And I think they, 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 when we set them side by side, they can be correctives to each other. So um, I, what I have to offer here is one approach, but if it goes astray, maybe it'll be corrected by, you know, people working in theology or in other, other disciplines. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, so, but um, I don't, you know, I do want to say this. I want to, well, maybe I want to dig in my heels a little bit more, um, which is virtues, if it's a question of whether people possess them, well, if people possess them, they're supposed to make a difference in behavior. I mean, they're supposed to have empirical traction. They are supposed to influence whether people behave a certain way or not. And if it turns out that the majority of people in these studies collectively are not exhibiting the kind of pattern of behavior that I would have hypothesized if they were virtuous, then that has to be dealt with. Maybe it's not conclusive, maybe it doesn't prove anything, but it's a it's an anomaly. It's anomalous. It's it's surprising. It needs to be dealt with. And one way to deal with it is just to conclude most people aren't virtuous, which is what I conclude. Max, I'm going to get to you in one second. I want to um, try to summarize a few questions from the audience for you, uh, Christian. And it might it has to it, it may bear some similarities to Oliver's question in terms of the controls that are used on the uh, empirical means of gathering data. Um, how much um, how much variance does it allow? Is it all sort of the Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic people? Really? Are there variances for socioeconomic, uh, uh, ethnic differences, uh, or, uh, or does it kind of presume a stable human nature uh, that humans yeah. are one thing? And yeah, great, great question, great question. I I should have said this in my presentation. Um, it's it's very much uh, biased, or maybe not biased is the right word, but um, we want to be very careful how broadly, we want to make any conclusions from this data. This data. Um, so what Josh summarized there was weird, uh, was become called the, the weird uh, participants. And they are, they are participants, but they are, as the name suggests, one kind of participants, and not the only kind of participants. So um, to answer the question directly, almost all of the studies that we have in leading psychology journals use participants from Western industrialized nations. Um, so I want to say, if you pin me down more here, and, and, and like if I'm being more careful in my claims, I would not say most people don't have the virtues. I would say most people in this population group don't have the virtues. Now, it, it's College just- College students are terrible. What's that? So the college students are terrible. Yeah, no, no, no. How, how, how do I, I don't want to pick on that in particular. Um, it tends to, a lot of these participants are college students, um, but, but there are many others who are not in, in these studies. So, you know, adults and so forth. Um, well, college students are adults. Um, uh, anyway, um, so, you know, now, so it's just an open empirical question what's going to happen when we do other studies with other groups? 
It could be that you see the same patterns of behavior. It could be that you see different patterns of behavior. It could be that in certain areas, there's more virtue, more evidence of virtue than I think uh, emerges from this data. So I, 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 whoever uh, asked those questions, I'd certainly take that on board. I was a little sloppy in how I presented this and I want to re uh, restrict the conclusions just to the main population groups of these studies. Great, thanks Christian, that's helpful. I'm feeling the need for some Apostle Paul and moral philosophy. So oh, Max, no. are you gonna help us out oh, with no. that? Um, sure, um, I, well, I would love, love the paper. And so I uh, just wanna say that uh, some of the major conclusions I would concur with and so, but I'm gonna press maybe on nuance. And so one area of nuance would be on agency. So it, it seems to be an inference that um, if pe uh, people have the general same starting point, that most of us are non-virtuous, then uh, the inference is, is that through training of some type or some sort of um, behavior modification program or virtue training, whatever you want to call it, uh, then we can show improvement uh, in the acquisition of certain virtues. And that's where I would, and that Christianity and perhaps positive moral psychology kind of share that assumption. So that's where I want the nuance to come in. Um, I think, for example, if I draw in the example of ancient philosophy, there's actually a debate on whether training alone can actually produce the virtues. So if you take, for example, Paul, the Apostle Paul's contemporaries, the Middle Platonists, they would say that not everyone with training can become virtuous. They would actually say that you have to be born with the right nature. You have to have an inclination toward virtue. Um, so the examples they give are kind of ones that we might even find in the New Testament where you can't get good fruit out of a bramble tree or a thorn bush. The, 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 the nature of the plant has to be such that fruit can be born from it. Um, you can't train a snake, but you can train a horse. So uh, I would say that it seems to me, if, if this is the question I would like to ask, that what's positive psychology seems to assume that uh, with training, any human being can produce virtue, or at least maybe the human beings that are in our Western world. Um, but if that's the case, then Christianity would press against it because I do think that while for, uh, perhaps Stoics and Epicureans, other contemporaries of Paul, would believe that every human nature has potential for virtue. Um, Christianity might agree with the Middle Platonists a little bit more that there has to be some divine intervention, um, some empowerment. Uh, this is where the Holy Spirit comes in, where human nature is somehow redeemed uh, so, or, or equipped better so that training and or spiritual exercises actually are effective. That by human nature alone, we don't have the agency to produce the virtues. And so I would like to just pose the question of whether I understand positive psychology correctly as being more like the Stoics and Epicureans? And if so, um, how would you, uh, how, where does the Holy Spirit come in then? Is it just an add-on or is the Holy Spirit essential in the development of moral virtue? Great, great. yeah, there's a lot, a lot there and I may not be able to yeah, address yeah. everything. Thank you for mm -hmm. the question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't know if I could speak on behalf of positive psychology, I'll just speak on behalf of Miller psychology. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you my own, my own opinion here. Um, so first of all, I think you're absolutely right that there's um, not everyone is equipped for virtue. Um, one case he, here that's relevant is psychopaths. Um, so a psychopath is not clear to me that psychopaths can develop virtue, so long as they're psychopaths. Um, so that right, right off the bat, uh, not everyone's going to be equipped. Um, to you know, have the capacity to develop virtue. Um, another point I want to highlight is that there, there's a difference between um, growing in virtue, or so there's a difference between acquiring virtue and improving one's character. And what I was focusing on mainly was just improving your character. But it's going to depend a lot on where you start from. So a someone who's very vicious but for whatever reason is motivated to become a better person, they throughout the course may never get to be vir virtuous. Um, and they may, uh, they may make some steady progress, 
and go from being vicious to being mixed, having a mixed bag of a character, or a weak, maybe weak virtue, but they may never get all the way to being fully virtuous. And so a lot of what I had to talk about was just how can we, wherever our starting point is, vicious, mixed character, moderate virtue, take steps to improve, right? Each person's gonna start from a different place, and the amount of improvement is going to vary from person to person as well. And so you, you know, you Max are already very virtuous, so you don't have much further far to go. I'm not very virtuous, and so I have a lot of room to grow. And I might, I might not make much progress. You might make a lot of progress. That's all going to vary from from person to person. Now, um, another thing you brought up was about the role of the Holy Spirit in all this, and I think that that perfect virtue is unattainable by human beings left to our own devices. Uh, I think some degree of virtue is attainable by human beings left to our own devices. So an atheist can attain some degree of virtue, um, but I think no one religious or secular left to their own devices can become perfectly virtuous. That's one area where it's going to take divine intervention going to take divine assistance, not the only one, maybe there's more, more to be said. Um, but if we are supposed to, from a Christian perspective, develop the character we were supposed to have all along, to have to possess the character, the perfect character we we're supposed to have all along, that's going to take divine assistance. And that's, that's going to be in the next life. It's not going to be in this life. The, those are my initial thoughts, at least. Great. Um, can I just ask a short follow-up? Um, therefore, uh, you know, when I looked at the secular practices and the Christian practices in your presentation, I could find analogs across both sides. So, you know, e exemplar, and we have top, we have ideas of Christian discipleship and being mentored. So, whatever secular example you had, I could find a Christian one. So, I would like to just simply ask, perhaps, if I were to press distinction, do you think that perhaps something that Christianity offers um, is the idea where practices um, kind of directly engage uh, participation in the divine. So if prayer is just more than meditation, um, perhaps there, what, what, what separates Christian secular practices is the degree in which divine intervention plays a role in virtue acquisition. But I just wanted to know if you were to think about what, are there any distinctly spiritual Christian practices that differentiate itself from secular ones? What would you name them to be? And I just suggested prayer as being possibly one. Yeah, so I, I, again, I, I would probably here defer to you all who are much more expert than me. Um, I, I take the general point that all the practices I mentioned have secular analogs, all the Christian practices I mean, yeah, yeah. have secular analogs and the secular approaches have Christian analogs. That's, mm. that's right as well. Um, so prayer by itself is not distinctively Christian. Um, the conception of prayer that you advanced, mm. um, where it's, in terms of engagement with the divine, that might be distinctively Christian from a from Christian perspective, right? Um, but prayer by itself would not be. So uh, I I think I um, I want to just uh, take your suggestion there um, that certain forms maybe of prayer if they involve engagement with the divine would be distinctively Christian and maybe have uh, an additional impact in developing character. I, I, I don't wanna take that on board. Yes, thank you. Harder Thanks. to study, harder to study though, because it's harder to test for the actual connection with the divine. <laughs> it's yeah, possible, yeah, it's possible to run these kind of studies for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Paul or Oliver, uh, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, another question, um, one of you'd like to get in or comment? Well, I, I have a question I could ask if Paul is not um, um, about to burst with his. <laughs> Go for it, Oliver. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very interested to hear Christian um, reflect on the classical doctrine that was called the unity of the virtues. Uh, the doctor that you really cannot have one virtue, but that if you have one virtue, you must have all. Um, imagine someone being described to you as sober, hardworking, compassionate, faithful to his partner and family, 
but a habitual liar. Do you believe that that is a possible constellation of moral qualities? Um, would it be different if he was honest, but a habitual drunkard? Would that be easier to believe? Is there a sense in which one bit of lack of virtue is going to undermine virtue as a total project, as a, as a homogenous project? If virtue is a homogenous project, ultimately all unified, what does that tell us about um, models and the sorts of models we're prepared to take of virtues? Ought we to be avoiding heroes and extreme characters as our models? People who demonstrate massive courage, but really have no common sense, for example. Um, or to put it another way around, why on earth would anyone want to take Simeon Stylites as a model? <laughs> Very good. Yep, yep, that's great. Um, <laughs> there's lots of really good ideas there. Um, so, so for those who are not familiar with this study of unity of the virtues, um, what Oliver is referring to is a, a, a doctrine that comes to us from the ancient Greek philosophers, maybe from other places too, but. Aristotle is most famously associated with it. And according to Aristotle, uh, in order to have one virtue, you have to have all of them. So they come in a package deal. So if someone's lacking in one virtue, that means they lack in all of them. If someone possesses one virtue, that means they possess all of them. This doctrine is extremely controversial, as you might imagine. Uh, let me just report to you that, uh, as far as I know, no contemporary philosopher working in on character accepts this doctrine anymore. I, 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 when I say no, there's probably a counterexample, so I'll probably be wrong, but almost no philosopher accepts this doctrine anymore, and I don't accept it either. Uh, it just seems to me that virtues can come in packages, but not, not have to come in complete packages. So you might get a couple of virtues that cluster together, like in Oliver's example, but you don't have to have the whole package. Uh, one example is uh, very, I mean, any, any example I'm going to give you is controversial, but one example is a courageous mobster. Um, seems to me that there can be a courageous mobster. Someone has the virtue of courage, but is also a mobster. Um, the, uh, the reference to exemplars, it seems to me that these people never, with a couple of exceptions, like Jesus, never had all the virtues. Um, they at best had a couple of virtues, but then it had some serious flaws too. Um, so Leopold Socha, the person from uh, the, the, the Polish uh, town I gave an example of, he was, he was exemplary for compassion, but had some serious flaws. Um, Lincoln was not very exemplary in other parts of his life. Martin Luther King was not in, in parts of his life. Gandhi was not in parts of his life. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a much more of a piecemeal person about this. I want to have, I want to have these exemplars. I want to hold them up. I don't want to get rid of them just because they're not virtuous across the board, but I wanna hold them up as exemplary in a certain area with respect to a certain virtue, end of story. And don't go too far beyond that. So I'll, uh, I'll let that be the last, my last thought there. Well, we're just about out of time for today. Uh, I wanted to thank Christian, Joshua Moderating, and our panelists. Also wanna thank the audience for joining us in the event and participating in the questions. Uh, Christian, I have one last question for you as we wrap up our talk, uh, but let me first make a, just a couple announcements. Our next event will be uh, December 10th with Eleanor Stump, Suffering and Flourishing. So hopefully you'll uh, mark your calendars and be able to join us again at that time as we continue this discussion. Uh, also, after this event, you'll be receiving a link to a post-event evaluation. Uh, please please uh, do uh, complete that evaluation. We very much value your feedback. It only takes a few minutes, and uh, by completing the survey, you will be entered into a, an Amazon uh, gift card giveaway awarded with each event. Um, so then, Christian, uh, this talk has largely uh, been about virtue or character formation rather than this or that virtue. Um, I like the way that uh, Oliver's, Oliver's comment mentioned that situations are sort of virtue uh, underdetermined, so we have to sort of any particular set of virtues can be um, attended to in a situation. Um, so I would love to hear you talk about uh, some particular virtue formations. Um, 
incidentally, you're, you've recently received another major grant uh, in this area of character formation. And it is on a particular virtue, that of, of truthfulness or honesty. Uh, for our viewers interested, you could check it out at honestyproject.philosophy.wfu, Wake Forest University, edu. Uh, but to end the talk, I just want to give you an opportunity, uh, one, to plug your new project, and then second, in this sort of contextually underdetermined moment uh, that we live in right now, I'd love to ask you a more general question of uh, why honesty? What do you think is, is important in particular about that virtue uh, that it's captured your attention um, in the area of interest? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, thank you to everyone again for organizing this and thanks Jeff for, for all your role in this, in this event. Um, my, uh, this Honesty Project is something we just started in August. Uh, it's our third major project that we've had at Wake Forest, starting with the Character Project 10 years ago and then the Beacon Project, which was focused on moral saints and heroes. The Honesty Project uh, is a three-year project looking at the virtue of honesty specifically from the perspectives of philosophy, and empirical research. And we're uh, funding researchers all over the world in the amounts of about $2 million to do new uh, uh, research in this area. The empirical research competition has closed. The philosophy research competition is still open. So you can actually have time to get in an application if you want, get some funding for that. Uh, but come check out our website and see what we're doing. Uh, and tomorrow, I actually, I'll have a, a piece in the New York Times um, if it all goes well uh, on this on this research that we're doing on honesty and uh, in character. So um, the, to address your, your main question, um, why honesty? Well, from my own perspective as a philosopher, it's stunningly neg neglected. I mean, and there's almost nothing written on the virtue of honesty in the last 50 years. Uh, no, the, the one book, three articles, and no edited volumes in 50 years of philosophical work. Uh, and that's, that's, that's amazing. So there's not much work on it. I mean, people aren't paying attention to it. It needs to be, it seems a second thought. It needs to be paid attention to. It's an extremely vir important virtue. It's an extremely influential one. It has to do with everything from lying, cheating, stealing, uh, promise keeping, misleading, uh, you know, um, fraud, bullshitting, you know, all across the, the board, tons of different kinds of actions. Uh, fall under the scope of honesty. And the last thing I'll, I'll plug for it is when you ask people what character trait is most important to them or what they think they look for in another person, honesty is usually at the top of the list. So I think it's, it's time we paid a lot more attention to honesty and not just, by the way, um, it looks like it is in our society and our political landscape, uh, we could also use a lot more of it. <laughs>